Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour. It's a delight to see all of you here. I'm Marcia Day Childress in the School of Medicine Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics. Our center is proud to produce the University of Virginia's Medical Center Hour. Our program today starts a new season, our 49th season. For nearly a half century, this hour at midday in midweek has hosted some of UVA's richest conversations on current and sometimes controversial matters of common concern to medicine, healthcare, and society. Medical Center Hour may be a medical school program, but since its founding, it has welcomed everyone at UVA and the public as well. This is an inclusive forum where science and society meet, clinic and community converse, town and gown come together, professional pathways intersect. Most of all, for you, our audience, consider this your forum. We encourage, indeed, we expect your voices and views to be part of every Medical Center Hour. A reminder to the clinicians in the audience, we award nursing as well as medical continuing education contact hours. Your handout contains instructions for physicians and nurses who wish to request continuing education credit. And our grateful thanks, Medical Center Hour is partly funded by the School of Medicine's John F. Anderson Memorial Lectureship, created in 1955 by 1895 medical alumnus, Dr. John Anderson. His gift keeps on giving. Today, Medical Center Hour takes an up-close and personal look at refugees, persons who have fled imminent danger in their homelands to find refuge in the U.S. and build new lives here. Human migration on many fronts globally is everywhere in the news, and many persons displaced due to persecution, conflict, or violence seek asylum in this country. Here in a nutshell is the situation of the refugee as voiced in 1943 by refugee Hannah Arendt, who fled Nazi Germany. We were immigrants or newcomers who left our country. We wanted to rebuild our lives, that was all. In order to rebuild one's life, one has to be strong and an optimist. So we are very optimistic. Our optimism indeed is admirable, even if we say so ourselves. The story of our struggle has finally become known. We lost our home, which means the familiarity of daily life. We lost our occupation, which means the confidence that we are of some use in this world. We lost our language, which means the naturalness of reactions, the simplicity of gestures, the unaffected expression of feelings. We left our relatives, and our best friends have been killed. And that means the rupture of our private lives. Powerful words, personal words from her essay, We Refugees. Our principal presenter today is Rabbi Lee Bicell from the University of San Francisco, where he is the Sinton Visiting Professor of Holocaust, Ethics, and Refugee Studies. He's the author of this very new book, published just last Friday. Refugees in America, Stories of Courage, Resilience, and Hope, that offers, in their own words, the stories of 11 newcomers to the United States. They're representative of all the refugees who've settled among us, but they're also remarkable for the singular experiences they've endured as displaced persons and the individualized ways they've reinvented themselves in America as Americans. They are some of the real people at the heart of today's often fractious political debates about immigration. You'll find a bio sketch of Rabbi Bicell in your handout. Following his remarks, we'll hear briefly from two medical students whose short bios you'll also find in your handout. Haley Mead and Jeffrey White are members of the Generalist Scholars Program and the Medical School Class of 2022. They're going to talk about why and how they, as future primary care doctors, can care and advocate better for patients, including refugees, whose situations and stories they know. Thanks are due the Generalist Scholars Program for partnering with us as part of their observance of Primary Care Week at UVA. 
Thanks, too, to the Department of Medicine for making this program a medical grand rounds and a priority for residents. Thanks to Charlottesville's Welcoming Week for hosting Rabbi Bysel's other talks in our community. And thanks to UVA Bookstore for making Lee Bysel's book available after the program. He'll also be available to sign copies. And now, without further ado, Refugees in America with Lee Bysel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. I, I just before uh, we really get started, I just want to make sure you saw the nice sport coat. But I could take it off now. That'd be okay. Okay, terrific. But it's impressive, right, to wear the. Yeah. Oh, I just. Oh, now I messed everything up for this. But oh boy, is that better now? Okay, good. Sorry about that. First, I want to thank Professor Professor Childress for introducing me and for the outstanding work she's been doing here for since 1996. And um, I've just heard great things about this medical center hour. And I'm grateful for the time that you've all taken to come to this. I also just very much want to acknowledge my friend Della Alexander, who was the former administrator of the Social Issues in Medicine course and the General Scholars Program in the School of Medicine for really being key to coordinating my whole trip uh, here to Charlottesville. And uh, she was, of course, supported by her husband, Rabbi Dan Alexander, and I'm very happy they're both here. So we have a lot to get into, and um, we'll, we'll do that together. Let me grab the book. Um, and I have this. Terrific. Let me just go into this. So I want to start by telling you a little bit how this began for me. But I first want to start with all of us here on September 17th, 2019. This work focuses on the story of 11 people, refugees, who came from different countries, different times, different ages, different stories. And one of the things I'm always mindful of is every one of us has a story. Every human being you'll encounter in your professional careers has a distinct story and one of the things I worry about greatly in our culture in general, I've worried about this for a long time, is that does the human story get lost in a world where we're so busy and bombarded with information? How do we find the time to really hear the story? And one of the things I found in the research and all the interviewing with these magnificent people and many others and my time in refugee camps, people always thank me for listening to their story and they say, Lee, no one's ever bothered to really ask about anything. They just want to know the details of an incident that occurred or whatever. So for me, it started in a very personal way. And I want to emphasize, I always like to be very clear, there's three words I want you to take away today, and that's courage, resilience, and hope, which I think is the narrative of the refugee, building on what Hannah Arendt said in that great essay, which I highly recommend, um, and what that means in our lives. So, my story, this part of my story, I guess say, I would say began in 2003. I heard a little bit one night coming home from work on the radio about a genocide. They were projecting a genocide to be starting in the Darfur region of, Sub of Sudan. And it really hit me. There was something about how the person on the radio talked about it and about the lives and just really touched me. You know how certain things happen like that in life. I went home, and my wife Judy is here with us today too, and I appreciate her coming out from San Francisco. And I talked. To, we talked about the following. I was not alive during the Holocaust. The bottom line, which is often very difficult for us to grapple with in the world, the world stood by for the most part. Fundamentally, we stood by, and it happened. So I wasn't alive. I can't feel terribly guilty about that personally. But Lee Bicell was very much alive. The dean had two sons already, uh, a dean of a school, and um, during Rwanda. And I, Lee Bicell, did nothing during that genocide. I didn't call one congressperson, one senator. I didn't write uh, one letter. I didn't give one penny to any humanitarian cause or anything. President Clinton, as many of you know, has taken responsibility for our lack of action during Rwanda because his actions, our actions, by jamming radio waves, what they say, and if you go to Rwanda, if you've been there before, it could have saved half the lives. 
But in 2003, when I heard this, because I don't like we learn from history, what, what matters is what we do now, what we learn and how we go forward. And I said to Judy, I want to do something. But trust me, I, un I did not understand what that meant. I then looked at humanitarian organizations, make a long story short, and I wanted something West Coast, based in California, and I found this wonderful group, International Medical Corps. Anybody familiar with International Medical Corps? That's very common. So Doctors Without Borders gets all of our attention for their international work, but they are political. And so they would label what was happening in Darfur as a genocide. And when you label something politically, you often get uh, asked, very politely or not politely, to leave the country. International Medical Corps made their choice when they got shaped in 1985 and they went originally with doctors and nurses to Afghanistan, that they were not going to be political, that they were going to remain apolitical, allowing them to stay in country and provide humanitarian medical services for much longer. So they're located in Santa Monica. I went and met with their, uh, their president, their vice presidents, and I said, I want to go to bear witness. I want to be on the ground, so I'm not just reading about it. I want to see what people are living, what their stories are to experience. So in the fall of 2004, I made my first trip to a Darfuri refugee camp in eastern Chad. And what I want to just say about that as a lens into it are a couple things. One is when you're out in a refugee camp and you're sitting in a clinic and you see people coming in and describing the kinds of diseases they have over there and what they're suffering from, the medicines available, which do not in any way equal what we have or the kinds of people who they have access to or what a hospital looks like there. Another time I can show you lots of uh, show, uh, pictures of that, but it's not for today. But I'll never forget one image from that first trip in 04, walking around the refugee camp, very hot, sub-Saharan desert, and I saw a boy about 14 or 15 years old tied to a tree. And I asked someone later in the day, they who had been with me, I said, why was that young man tied to the tree? And this person who uh, was not American, but they were not uh, local either, they were from, I think, it's another country in Africa, they said, that boy has some kind of psychiatric issues. We have no medicines for him. We don't know, they don't know what to do in the refugee camp. And they find that the best thing for him is to tie him to the tree during the day. It was agonizing to see and to realize that that's the plight of so many people out in refugee camps, or as Professor Childress spoke about, all these people migrating around the world. So on that first trip, I listened. I heard the worst stories I've ever heard in my life of brutal rapes of women, of horrific things that had happened to families, villages that had been destroyed, diseases that had ravaged a family. And then I heard the best stories. I met some of the best people in the world, the medical people who work in refugee camps or in, out in these different sites where people are fleeing. Um, all the humanitarian workers who really give up their life for a period of time to work in the toughest conditions and do everything. That led to many, many other trips. And now we jump ahead many years later. And I said, we are living now in a world where the word refugee immigration is becoming the political hotbed of our times and it's only increased. It started a number of years ago our inability to pass comprehensive immigration reform, um, all these kinds of things. Again, lengthy discussion of that. And by the way, we've never had a coherent, comprehensive immigration reform policy. So all this tumult, and what I find in a lot of discussions I've listened to over the past five, six, seven years, is people struggling with how do you even discuss it? How do you get to it? And I always think of a quote I learned many, many years ago by um, the famous Supreme Court Justice, uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, what we desire is not simplicity, and we often live either in simplicity or complexity. Either we make it a very simple narrative, right? This is the simple story, uh, the danger of a single story, Chinui Adichie has written about that, or we make something so complex 
none of us can understand it, right? It's just, it's impossible. And that's the current situation we have with immigration, refugees, everything, asylum, all lumped in together, laws, political things, all that rhetoric you know as well as I do. And what the justice said is I desire simplicity on the other side of complexity. So the questions that were missing in the national dialogue for me, by many people, by our political leaders of both parties, were the following questions. What's an ethical approach to this? What's the humane approach to this? What's a just approach to this? How do we balance human dignity and living in a world with more people wandering this earth with our own needs for security and protection? How do you do that in a way that uplifts the human being? And I said, maybe in some little way, I can make a contribution to this by bringing to life the narrative again of who refugees are, that we don't lump them all together, that yes, people from Cambodia are different than people from Eritrea, and everybody from Cambodia, they may have a shared narrative, many of them, but they each are different individuals. So I wanna share with you uh, this afternoon a little bit of a few people's stories. And I want to start with um, Marin Samador. So Marin, I worked with a photographer. I believe the visual is very important, that in looking at the visual, and you can learn a lot by seeing his eyes, his smile. Um, you don't really see the journey he's been on, but close up, you see it on his face. So Marin was born in Eritrea, and I, I want to start with Eritrea because that's a country not on our radar. If I were to ask you where the greatest genocide's coming up now, people might talk about the Rohingya Muslims. People might talk about the whole mess and terrible human suffering in Syria or Afghanistan and the amount of refugees. But we have more and more people coming from Eritrea that since its independence uh, nearly 30 years ago, um, it has really been amidst a war and suffering. And in the book, the style that I came up with and which I feel very strongly about because it reflects more than just a stylistic way of writing, is that I'm simply the narrator. I simply listen to these 11 people. So my words go the normal length of a page. Their words are center and italicized. So I don't say Marin felt this while he was going through that. I let Marin speak for himself. So today, you're only gonna hear their words. You don't need to hear um, my words. So I wanna read one part first. So Marin grew up uh, with his mother, just a sense in his entire life. His dad, when he died, when Marin was 12, he'd probably spent, as he said, no more than 30 days in his entire life with his dad. He was in the military, he was away, and he was killed in one of the wars with Ethiopia. So Marin is reflecting and he shares here about going into military training. Now, in Eritrea, military training is for life. It's not two years, three years, five years. It's just for life, and you probably get out when you're older and not able to do anything if you're lucky to have survived it. But one of the things that he goes into here is the following, and it leads into some of the subjects we'll talk about. The first six months, we accepted the military training. And it's a common theme, by the way, among refugees. They accepted certain things. They didn't believe it would get worse. There's a lot of punishment, but we were kind of okay with it. But when school started, the treatment didn't change because they let some of the younger soldiers go to school too. Unexpectedly, they would tie your hands. At times, we were told to stand in the sun in extreme heat without moving for a half an hour or an hour or longer, people would drop to the ground fainting, or they would tell you just get to the ground, make you crawl, and beat you with sticks. They tied my hands to my legs behind me. My face was on the ground, hands and legs tied by my bed curtains on a hot sunny day in the open area. Sometimes there was no meaning to it, why they did it. Many times in the person in charge, if he was angry, um, they just did it. We learned, and then here Marin, and this is the wonderful part as one learns more and more about people, we get to the reflective part. So Marin says, we learn to accept it as part of our life. And what I find is when refugees are going through their experiences of trauma, of horror, of a nightmare, 
They're not asking the kinds of questions we can ask today. They're not being reflective. When you're going, will I live another day? When you're dang and you're one of the lost boys of South Sudan and you're walking a thousand uh, miles and you don't know whether you can go on one more day, you're just thinking about existence, some food, of remaining healthy, of not being shot. But Marin, when he had gone on to South Africa, he says, later I started to ask, but what are you going to become if that's how they treat you? A productive citizen? How are you going to think out of the box? How are you going to create? How are you going to lead a nation? And he was able to reflect on this later, but going through it. So it was horrific, a nightmare. They showed on broadcasts at the military camp of what happened to people who tried to flee Eritrea. And basically, you know the story is that they try to flee. They get shot at the border. They get shot going, trying to get to a refugee camp in South Sudan. Marin decided he had to go, and he made a plan with two friends. He went home to see his mother. And again, the long-term impact of what this means, he could not tell his mother because he did not know. Sorry about that. I always struggle with these kinds of things, but we'll get it. We'll be okay. Um, I use my hands a lot, as you can see. Um, is that he could not tell his mother because there was the risk that a neighbor, she might tell, whatever. The next day he goes back and he and his two friends leave and they begin a journey like many refugees have, fleeing, terrified. They get to South Sudan, refugee camp. And he has, and I would say this is another key theme that runs if you look at common themes. Everyone that I've spoken to or most have some good luck or somebody in their lives that helps them out at some point overseas or when they get here to America. He happened to have an uncle in South Africa who was able to send him funding, got him to Khartoum, the capitalist of Sudan, took him through a number of countries, and he goes to South Africa. Ultimately, Marin comes to the States, but it's not easy. And here, I want to share with you, because part of what I've tried to do here, and in part of the human story, it would be easy just to write a book, or not easy, but we've all seen horrific things. One of the things I find in teaching Holocaust and genocide, I show very little brutality or scenes like that, because you know what? People, we see it all on TV or movies, much worse, so it doesn't really bring people in for me to show a picture of Marin Hogtide. You all have seen that on a TV program or a movie theater or something like that. I tried to capture the nightmare of their journey, but also their insights, because here what I come to, their insights really connect to you and me. Those themes of courage, resilience, and hope, as I said to my friends, the whole crisis we're in now is not about all the people who want to come here and can't. It's really about us and who we are. So here Marin, now in South Africa, says to, uh, shares, um, this part with me. I started to question myself a lot. It's like I was lucky. I got the chance to study and he had a good job. He was getting paid well. But there were a lot of people dying back in Eritrea every day. That could have very well been my fate. And I think it took it very personally. I started asking, what can I do? At some point, I remember asking all sorts of people, why is it like this? And one could put here in parentheses, why are people treating other people this way? What is it about? Is it in our nature? Can it ever be changed? Will we ever have a world where people can treat all people, even those different than us, with respect and dignity? And then he says, um, I started asking psychiatrists, professors, pastors, you name it, all sorts of people who have a, might have a better understanding about the meaning of life, and there wasn't anything that I was able to get from them. And what he talks about later is that maybe he wasn't ready to hear it. But what Marin shares as a lens into many of the people in the book is that a lot of people don't really want to hear the stories. And I have to tell you, I found that personally. I made six or seven trips to Chad. I was in Haiti. I was in Kenya, all over around the world. When I would come back, Judy and I would meet people. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you were just in Chad. Um, how was it? And I would say, well, it was very powerful. Um, well, what should we order for dinner? They don't want to take the story into their hearts and souls because it does change you when you get to know these people and mean them. So Marin settles here in the United States. 
He's on the process now of becoming a citizen. Hopefully he'll become a citizen. But part of what Marin captures and what he's taught me is the profound power of patience. For refugees, everything takes much longer than it does for us. You have to add a couple extra years into their storyline of getting settled, of getting accepted, of going to a university that will take you, that might give you a scholarship, that kind of thing. And Marin was chosen in December of 2016 for the graduate commencement at the University of San Francisco. He'd gotten an MA in human rights to give the commencement address. You could, he presented, by the way, he started with presenting the international refugee flag to um, the president of the university who unfolded it and it was so powerful to see that image on stage. He shared this and again, I know this quote because I've known Marin for a long time and I've all the interviews and everything like that. This is, I often joke about Chinese fortune cookies when you go to a restaurant. You know, we get them, we laugh a bit, we say, well, that, boy, that really is meaningful. Sometimes you maybe put it in your pocket. But many of them are powerful. And you hear a quote like this, and we often forget about it. But he says the following. He said it that day, December 2016. It's not an easy road, but hope is the oxygen of my life. I have hope in humanity. Now, part of it is for all of us living in this world on September 17th, 2019, and I'd love to spend time with each of you if we ever had the time. I think we're grappling for hope in the world we live in. We wonder how far we've come, and here I don't mean it in a religious sense, but just in a, a narrative sense. Look at the Bible. You're all kind of familiar with that book. You, you remember there was Adam and Eve. They have two kids, Cain and Abel. What happens, and I would look at it as human authors, the first brother kills the first brother. What did the author authors see around the world? People harming each other. But Marin, who's been through everything, Hope is the oxygen of his life. I think for all you who work with patients, who see people who work in any way, or people who care about these issues, people need hope. They need to be treated humanely, with respect. And you see Marin and his face. Now, I want to go a little bit. I'm mindful of time and very much looking forward to bring you a little bit into two other stories. So I want to take you just to this woman, and you get picture the sense. So her name is Vani Loon. She's from Cambodia, suffered during the Pol Pot years, and I'm not gonna read all the insufferable um, experiences she went through and the brutality for four years being held by the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia. Hold on one second, I don't know why I keep doing that. I just want to share with you, so Vanny came here, got married, has four children, and until about three or four years ago, was holding on pretty well. But she shared this with me. It's amazing after what she experienced, and you know, reading her chapter is one of those things you just can't stop thinking about. Um, she writes, she shared with me, my memories of Cambodia, and she's been here since 1980, roughly. My memories of Cambodia are with me day and night. I see all the people getting killed, my friends being tortured, and horrific images of people being shot. I keep thinking about why these images will not leave me alone. The ones I want to know to remember, they don't come to my head. It is just the horrors of the past that come to me. And I'm so upset. I just want to go to jump in the ocean and die. I'm grateful my family and a few other people have given me the desire to stay alive, trying my best to rid myself of demons. She hangs on through the sources of a program in Oakland, a Cambodian she, uh, center that she goes to once a week. She meets with a social worker there. She doesn't have many resources. She's in desperate shape. She is taking some medications. But part of it, and I want to come right now to this punchline before just going a little bit to the third person, the most common thing I think in the medical profession that people see is what I would put in the range of PTSD and all the corollary issues that go along with that. 
depression, anxiety, um, just um, body pains and aches that uh, there's sort of nothing exactly wrong. And the issue, I think the challenge for people in general in your profession and, and what you're working in and what you enter into with the demands on our schedule is how does one listen to bring in the role of PTSD? Nobody has the time to hear the, do a full interview with Vanny and hear everything that happened to her in Cambodia. Um, to send her to a psychiatrist, often people lack the resources to even get there or know what to do or how, doesn't want to really tell her story. And many of their cultures, which are very important, important, I learned this in refugee camps in Darfur, where International Medical Corps works very closely with the indigenous African doctors about how they're treating patients, what they're using, that culturally Western medicine may be very different for many of these people, even if they've lived here for decades, that the kinds of things you and I know and take uh, just for granted, an antibiotic, for example, that may be a totally foreign notion to Vanny. I mean, she and I didn't discuss it. She is a woman totally suffering and like many refugees, falling through the cracks because even when the refugee program is up and functioning well, we only really help people in the first six months they're here, here and then they're kind of on their own. They have children, they have families. But that's the most poignant description in this book of the kind of PTSD and all that. I want to share with you um, this one and then I'm gonna, I look forward to Jeff and Haley and then questions. So one of the people in the book, the oldest person is a Holocaust survivor from Poland. Poland, horror of horrors. And this woman, Sidonia Lacks, very poignant story, but the narrative of growing up in a middle class family, having help, life changing in 1939 with the beginning of the war, ending up in Auschwitz and other camps. But she shares this, which I really want to uh, bring to life for you today. Because again, it captures an image that runs through this and people word it in their own context. And again, someone from Poland, and let me just go to her because you have to see her to really get her. That's Sidonia at 93 years old. Look at that, that's what she's like. So they are in a bunker a dirt bunker for about three months. She talks all about, and this is critically important, not washing, no vitamins, no food, nothing, uh, nothing that we would, no cleansing of any kind, maybe some dry beans, um, what would happen? So she was often selected to go out and try to find a little bit of food for people in the bunker where people are living in this tiny little bunker, 40, 50 people. And she, she shares with me, um, My mother and others made a plan to escape to hide with a Catholic family outside, and a Catholic policeman was supposed to look the other way. But when she went, he was not on duty. We heard shots. Slowly, slowly, people were disappearing from the ghetto and being killed outside. And going back to Professor, Professor Childress's quote of Hannah Arendt, that image of loss, a refugee has lost country, familiarity, nationality, language, the whole world is about loss for them. And then she says, at that time, I was eating from trash can leftovers. There I was, a teenager with no vitamins whatsoever for years now. My father had heard that somebody somewhere illegally had some apples for sale. He wanted in the worst way to get an apple for me. And I know you used to, in the past, that it would end with people getting an apple on the way out, and now you have some refreshments beforehand. My father never came back. All I know is that I lost my father because of an apple. Every time I eat an apple, I remember him. So with Sidonia, and this is a woman who I want to just say two or three things and open it up to Jeff and Haley and questions. In the millions and millions of refugees worldwide and in our country where we have about probably a total of 11 million counting in different ways between DACA, Dreamers, people who are just illegal, people will never get any status. They need to hold on to hope like Marin. They need to hold on to memory. 
But one of the things, with maybe the exception of Vanny, who I was very fortunate to get to, I met people who were all willing to talk with me, to be willing to be interviewed for a book. For every one of them, there's 10, 20 people living in an apartment somewhere who are older, like Sidonia, like Vanny, that they're too depressed to ever come out. They're too depressed to ever go see anybody in the health services. Sidonia, somehow, resilience is the word that grabs her, and courage, in the sense that at a certain point, most survivors, by the way, don't want to share it with their children. I lived through it, so why should my kids know about it? Let them enjoy life in America. She chose to go out and speak about it. She's been doing it for 20 years, and I include in her chapter letters that say, Sidonia, I learned more from you than anyone else I've ever met in my life. You taught me the real meaning of perspective, of what's important in life, of what's not important. So for me, out of this book, it was a lens into the real world of the refugee as a way to start and engage in a different kind of dialogue around this country about the ethics of how we treat people, about what is just and reasonable, and also to always remember that their stories are connected to ours. We're not all that different, right? It just happens where we were born, opportunities given us, but what can we learn from them about courage, resilience, hope, perspective, and what can we do to help people to cope with the PTSD as a general category that emerges in so many ways when they're unable to and not equipped to deal with it themselves and might not want to take meds, how do we best help them? So I, these 11 people represent a lot, I think, to all of us. I'll come back in a little bit for questions, but I'm really thrilled that Jeff and Haley are here to ask, uh, to give a response. So thank you, Jeff and Haley. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Bysell, for that incredible uh, introduction and for warming the crowd up for us. We appreciate that. Um, uh, we did have the great pleasure to read your book uh, in the past couple weeks, and the stories of these brave men, men and women and everything they went through and overcame were truly, truly inspiring. Uh, we also want to thank each and every one of you for uh, coming out this afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Childress, for letting us talk. Um, to introduce ourselves, I'm Jeffrey White. And I'm Haley Maid. And we are second year medical students here at UVA. Uh, we're both proud members of the Generalist Scholars Program, a scholarship group dedicated to training the next generation of leaders in the field of primary care. This being primary care week, we wanted to define primary care as it means to us. Because it's more than just wiping runny noses and prescribing different medications. Um, primary care involves treating the patient as well as the family and the community while operating within an integrated delivery system. Primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, and other healthcare professionals work as a team to address a wide range of mental and physical health issues with the goal of developing sustained and beneficial relationships with patients. Most importantly, a primary care doctor acts as the center for a patient's healthcare treatment. In a sense, he or she ties together all the strings of a person's life to craft a holistic approach to medicine. For this reason, we consider not only the patient's medical history, but also their personal experiences, their goals and desires, and the wider, wider social circumstances in which they operate. In Professor Bysell's book, when we hear the story of Marin Simadar, a refugee from Eritrea, as you heard, or Noemi Perez-Lemus from Guatemala, or Sidonia Lax, a Holocaust survivor, it's impossible to ignore that an individual's lived experience is central to conversations about their health. More specifically, these stories remind us the impact trauma can have on one's life. Imagine losing your home, losing your family, losing your culture, losing your way of life. These occurrences alter the way that we think, the way that we process information, and the way that our body functions. Trauma-informed care is a hot topic in medicine today, and at a basic level, it is a recognition of and response to the impact of traumatic stress. Trauma-informed care emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety for both patients and providers. And it helps survivors rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. 
For example, in the book, Kian Ha Quoc Tien describes the cramped, disease-ridden boats that ferried refugees from South Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. When she arrives in America, she was quarantined for suspicion of tuberculosis. Only recently have these repercussions um, of her stressful life begun to impact her life. If it's not for trauma-informed care, how can we adequately build rapport and understanding, let alone treat her possible post-traumatic stress disorder? To focus on just physical issues without exploring past struggles is to miss traumas that could be the root cause of someone's issues. The relationship built through compassionate primary care provides the space for providers to hear these struggles, empathize with our patients, and build a trauma-informed environment. Relating to patients is a major challenge for young physicians in any situation, but especially if they are from different cultures or backgrounds. The men and women in Professor Bicell's book all want happiness and stability, but the prospect of connecting with them on a personal level after all they've been through is daunting. Most of us in this room don't know what it's like to escape genocide or have our hometowns ravaged by war, but to offer the highest standard of care, we have to empathize. For us, the first step is education. Several of the refugees stress the importance of getting an education in America, seeing that as their gateway to advancement. They talk about saving money and finding scholarships to attend community colleges, then four-year schools, and even advanced degree programs. But what's most striking was that none of them worked just for themselves. They saw education as the first step in being able to give back and help both their local refugee communities and their families back home. They went to school to become advocates for the people who were not as fortunate as themselves. One of the fundamental roles of the primary care physician is as an, as an educator. By giving patients the knowledge and confidence to make positive health decisions, we improve outcomes and limit costs to the whole health system. Language and cultural differences, not to mention limitations of health literacy, can make care for refugees difficult for the doctor and intimidating for the patient. Like most hospitals, UVA has services to overcome language barriers, but it is the responsibility of the physician to dig deeper. Refugees come to America in search of safety and opportunity. To have their hopes stifled by disease is to break the promises of our country. If a refugee has the strength to overcome so much hardship to arrive in your office, it is incumbent on you to bridge the gap. You may never be able to fully understand what he or she has been through, but the act of trying to understand accomplishes more than we can realize. While much of our talk has been focused on the role of primary care providers in the medical world, we must acknowledge that as physicians, we hold power in our community. We have a voice that many do not, and we must be active in the fight for justice. We must mirror the calling of Marin Simadar when he states, my calling is to give voice to those who have no voice. This fight can be as large as lobbying politicians in Washington or as small as saying hello to a new neighbor in your community. If you need a push, the International Rescue Committee of Charlottesville has countless opportunities to become involved. We are in a time when we have to do more than simply hope for better times. We must become involved. And for the students in the audience, the people in Professor Bicell's book remind us of why we came to medical school. If there's one thing we want you to take away from Primary Care Week is that it's not enough to pursue education for its own sake. We have to remember who we are working for. We won't all end up treating survivors of foreign wars or persecution, but what we're learning in the classroom and on the clerkships only matters to the extent that we use it to help those in need. We're all lucky to be in this room today, and it's up to us to spread that luck to others. Again, thank you all for joining us. We hope you were as moved by the story shared today as we were. We hope you take this as an action call to invest in your community, listen to your neighbors' stories, and work towards justice. And since this is Primary Care Week, uh, don't forget to get, up, get your yearly checkup. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. yeah, let me just say, well, first of all, Jeff and Haley, um, it's a little bit awkward in front of everybody, but it's kind of an intimate crowd. I, I invite you to, when you're finished, to move to the Bay Area and become my personal physicians. Uh, I like to plan for old age now, and so I hope you'll be in. But thank you. The rent's a little high for now, but. Oh, I, yeah, it is a little high. Thank you for those thoughtful responses and emphasizing certain things of understanding different cultures in all of our lives, not just in the medical profession, but of our neighbors and the communities we live in and that cultural diversity. And this notion of trauma, it's just, I want to just say one word before opening it for questions. I'll show you him. The, the notion that the trauma ends, it doesn't. Dang, lost boy of South Sudan, comes here to America, 
And, you know, you live in a great community here in Charlottesville. I really admire it, and you've had some very unfortunate things in these past few years, which you've, I think, overcome and dealt with beautifully. He's African, but he comes to America, and he becomes black. And there are people that all these people have said, you know, you have to understand what race means in America and all that. But let's tell you Deng and his story. He shared with me, and he, that's the guy who walked 1,000 miles in a year like the other Lost Boys, everything. Now in San Jose at this time, when he told me the story, wor uh, working at some kind of place, walking home, he liked to walk, and a car pulls over, a couple guys, and they say, uh, you need a ride. And Deng says, uh, no, thank you. And they could see he was different than they heard his accent. And uh, they said, you know, what's wrong with you? What, what's, what kind of accent is that? And he said, well, I'm from Sudan. And they said, well, take a ride. And he said, no, I just want to walk. They moved a few more yards up. One guy got out of the car, and there was a trash can filled with all kinds of junk left over, you know, banana peels and apples and sodas and beers and all that. And the guy dumped his trash can in, on top of Dane. And he reflects in the chapter about Dane that he wanted to go back to the refugee camp in Kakuma, where he had lived many years, because that was better than that humiliating experience. But then he decided he couldn't give up. So it's both the trauma of getting here and the trauma of navigating our system and working through our system and of being humiliated because of the color of your skin, your religious beliefs as a Muslim, your um, whatever it might be, not knowing the language. So I thank you both. And should we open it to questions now? OK, I, I'm very happy to take any questions. Yes, please. Um, Get the mics. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, so I had a question. I worked for a very long time with refugees. With uh, I've met lost boys. I've met Syrian refugees. I've met, you know, I, I, I've heard a lot of tough stories. But one of the toughest stories that I've heard, and one of the hardest one to reconcile in my mind was um, when it wasn't a refugee, but it was somebody who wanted to be considered one by the world and wasn't. Um, she was a Palestinian 16-year-old and um, talking about the humanitarian aid crisis in her country, in Palestine. Um, and I, I want to ask you, like, how do you reconcile that? How do you deal with a humanitarian aid crisis when people think a region is so politically complex that resources, good resources, run away from that region that needs help? It's a great question. So a couple parts to it. So worldwide, the count between refugees, internally displaced people, stateless people, roughly, and this just came up by the UNHCR, the UN High Commission on, Commissioner on Refugees, about 70 and a half million. I don't buy it, and anybody who I work with in the field, I think it's at least double, because you have to count all these people who don't have refugee status, and also, most refugees will never be resettled, maybe one or 2% at the best, are gonna be living in those conditions globally. And, the, and I'll make it very poignant for you. And I could say a lot about Palestinian refugees and the recognition of them. But in general, I'll give you an example. And this is international policy, but I asked my colleagues when I was out in the field. So one of my trips to the Greta in Eastern Chad. An international rule, and it goes right to your question, you're allowed to treat refugees. So you show your ID card. I came from Darfur. I come in. I'm sick you treat me or my uh, daughter is very, very sick and needs care or my wife is pregnant and needs prenatal care, whatever it is, I'm entitled to that of whatever is there. I'm a local Chadian, one of the poorest countries in the world with access to nothing. Legally, I can't go into the refugee camp and see the nurse or the doctor or the medical assistant or whoever it is. I'm not eligible. So I was at a meeting with 30 heads of agencies. This is in Injamina, the capital of Chad. And some high official from the UNHCR, this is about 15 years ago, came and was briefing all of us back there about these rules. And the person left. And I said to the people you know, privately afterwards, I said, do, do any of you follow those rules and not treat local people? And they said, of course not. We don't follow those rules. Once the UNHCR leaves, how do you turn away and say, oh, uh, Professor Childress, you're, you're a chatty and you're not eligible for services. So there's such desperate need. There's such desperate need. And just to add to it, 1951, when we have the Refugee Convention, they envisioned that as being lasting for a couple years of these international laws and all that. Because what was the goal? 
to resettle refugees in the aftermath of World War II. They, they actually believed that it would end in a couple years. It's only gotten worse, and the problem is how many people don't fit into a category, and even Deng, he was one of a select few that got chosen for resettlement. Many of his colleagues, friends, are somewhere wandering the earth or still back in a refugee camp. So great question. I don't know if I gave it full justice, but very important. Yes, please. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you uh, chose these 11 people, how they discovered you, how you discovered them, a little bit about your methodology and So methodology, a, a lot, a lot of work goes into this, a lot of networking, contacting everyone you know. So when it comes to the people from parts of Africa, I have tremendous contacts because of my years, you know, knowing people, that was easier. In general, so like the woman from Cambodia, the woman from Vietnam, Culturally, it's a very different kind of culture. I had no context. So in those kinds of situations, in a number of other situations too, I had to be vetted by a social worker or whoever, because that's the only way to get to them. They're coming to a clinic like here in Charlottesville. They're being seen by a social worker. They can't say, well, I'm seeing Miss X or Mr. Y. They have to say, I have someone who might be very interested. Let me talk to them. Then they vet me. and what. I think the way I was allowed in is that they didn't see me as voyeur, that I've been there, I've been on the ground, I've worked in this area, that I'm part of it. Then I met with their, their client, and the client approved me. Then we went into the interview. So hours and hours of vetting, approval. And for the 11 up here, I got very fortunate because I did a lot of vetting of my own, of, and I used networking everywhere. And, Miracles happen, like Ding, of how I got to Ding. I was looking up something. I met a woman in the Bay Area. She knows Ding. He lives in Michigan. She said, I'll fly him out from Michigan. And I'd done a lot of research in him. So the methodology and then the methodology of the interviews, just to say one part about that. My handwriting's terrible. Many people say I should have become a doctor, but it's another story. But absolutely terrible. I wouldn't use it even if my handwriting was perfect. When you see someone sitting, if I'm working with you, and I have to write everything down like this, what am I losing? Or I'm working on the computer, and I'm, I'm not focusing on you. So I transcribed everything, paid to have it transcribed. Then I would shape a very first draft, very different than the book, and I would send it back to you. It's your story. Now, I would have factual questions. What was the name of the village in northern Iraq? Was it Bashika or Bashira, or what was it? You'd correct it, and then sometimes people would say, Lee, that part I don't want in, or this is another section triggered off. That went through three or four kind of versions. Very long methodology and the type of interviews. And just so you know, one other thing very quickly, everyone has different styles. And I respect other people's styles of done with integrity and honesty and all that. I will not ask a woman, and you two have read the book, um, I will not ask the direct question, were you raped in country X? And um, I feel I, I can't do that. It goes beyond my scope. So there are some ambiguity in here that people want to say, well, what happened to X or Y? And I say, what she wanted to share is in the core of the book. But it's a lot about listening and taking a lot of time and patience. So it was quite a journey to get these 11. And they're around America, Houston, Atlanta. I was all over the country. Thank you. Uh, somebody else? Because I know um, a few minutes, maybe another question. I'm not in Charlottesville for very long, so really, anything else you want to ask me? So, uh, oh yes, yes, please, right up here, and then I'll give it, a, and then turn it back to Dr. Childress. Do you find that there's tension between um, healthcare resources for the refugee population and the rural or urban poor of America? The, of all uh, bet races? Uh, between the rural poor. Rural poor or urban poor, just or urban poor. Americans. So it's very similar. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Darwin, who is right, uh, this is Malk from Syria. Let me just show you Darwin real quick. Okay, Darwin was born blind in El Salvador, blind, totally blind until six years old. Long story, comes here. He's a DACA beneficiary, graduated USF, has a job now, flourishing well, but 
DACA beneficiaries are very worried right now. They don't know what sense to make of it. He has access to, has a job, has access to health care, all that kind of stuff. His parents, who probably are mid-40s, they're here illegally. There, there is no pathway to citizenship conceivable for them right now, because we're just talking about DACA, Dreamers, maybe some other special visas or whatever, but not like his parents. His dad had some kind of health condition, had to go to an emergency room, which again is the crisis for the urban poor, the, the rural poor for anyone. They don't have access to our, what you and I may have. Goes to the emergency room, ends up with a bill for $10,000. His dad, it takes him months, but he pays the bill. And one of the things, so there's a crisis in what's accessible, and there I would think there's a lot in common with the urban, anyone who's poor in this country, but with the added dimensions of this public charge issue. You probably have heard these words lately of being a public charge. Do I go to the hospital to risk treatment for whatever, father had something very seriously wrong, whatever it was, or is there gonna be someone in the waiting room or in the hospital that will report me and could I be deported? Where the poor person doesn't have to worry about that. So refugees have added stress. Before I, Dr. Childress comes back up, I just wanna say these people have given me hope on a micro level of how much we can do, how much one act makes a difference. I didn't give you all the examples of people who tutor kids and, or the person says, the woman came from my local church and she taught me how to drive in Houston. <laughs> my friends, courage, resilience, hope, we can do so much. And um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity and privilege. I wish we had hours, but I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Children. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Lee Bicell and also Jeff White and Haley Mead for a very thought-provoking hour. Uh, we hope there are lots of things you'll take with you from this time. Um, again, UVA Bookstore is there with a, a book that is eminently readable, quickly readable, um, and again, quite thought-provoking. Um, I love the photographs um, as well and the, the conversation, the way you oriented it around the pictures, and I was thinking when you were talking about your interview technique, um, I was thinking of all the doctors right now who are madly typing on the computer while talking to the patient, and sometimes missing the opportunity to see the patient face to face, and if we can find better ways to manage that, uh, we certainly will come away with a better sense of who this person is that we're working with. Um, we would welcome you coming back next week. Our program is with Dana Bowen Matthew from the UVA Law School talking about the public university and the public's health. And um, now join me, please, in thanking uh, Jeff and Haley and Lee Bicell um, and take their messages with you. Thanks. Thank you.